Y'all know every chance I get, I'm going to remind y'all about Malaysian Flight 370, right? Y'all know that, right? Just so the investigation can continue. Let's check this out. Is the biggest aviation mystery of all time the disappearance of Malaysian Airlines flight MH370 about to be solved? It looks so promising. I, I when I, you know, re, I get goosebumps because I feel this is it. Did you know that the mysterious disappearance of Malaysian Flight 370 is one of the most tragic and confusing events in aviation history? For many years, experts and people in charge worked very hard to find where the missing plane was, spending a lot of time and effort. Recently, a group of researchers made an unexpected and important discovery, showing where this well-known flight ended up. Join us as we explain every part of this amazing find, helping to clear up the big mystery that shocked the world. Chapter 1, Malaysian Flight 370. The mysterious story began in the early hours of a March day in 2014. It was 12.41 a.m. on March 8th, to be exact. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 was ready to start its trip. It was taking off from Kuala Lumpur International Airport, with Beijing Capital International Airport in China as its destination. The flight wasn't supposed to take very long, just a little over six hours. The plane used for this significant flight was a Boeing 777-200ER. This particular aircraft was not new. It had been in use for 12 years and was registered as 9M MRO. The pilot in charge was Captain Zahari Ahmad Shah. He was an experienced and highly skilled pilot, 53 years old. Captain Zahari had a notable career, having flown for 18 and 365 hours. He was familiar with this route and loved flying a lot. He often talked about his flying experiences and his passion for aviation on different online platforms. Joining him in the cockpit was First Officer Farek Abdul Hamid. At 27 years old, he was much younger and had 2,763 hours of flying experience. This flight was meant to be a training session for him, but sadly, it turned out to be his last. There were 10 now, dead- Early on, I was really, really looking at the, the pilot, right? Not the co-pilot. But now I'm starting to kind of turn my attention towards the co-pilot a little bit as well. I don't know what reason is leading me that way, but I'm going to pay attention and see, do they mention something any different that will keep me on that track? Dedicated flight attendants on board. Their job was to look after the safety and comfort of the 227 passengers, which included five children. Most of these passengers were from China. However, the plane also had people from various other countries, 38 Malaysians, and individuals from Indonesia, Australia, India, France, the United States, Iran, Ukraine, Canada, New Zealand, the Netherlands, Russia, and Taiwan. As the aircraft left runway 32R, it flew up into the dark night, heading in a northeast direction over the South China Sea. When the plane got to its cruising altitude of 35,000 feet, the crew contacted Kuala Lumpur Air Traffic Control to confirm their height. A bit later, as the plane was about to enter Vietnamese airspace, Malaysian Air Traffic Control sent a standard good night message. This was a signal that they were handing over control to the Ho Chi Minh Air Traffic Controllers. Captain Zahari replied with, Good night Malaysian 370, a typical response from a pilot when switching airspaces. But then, something unusual and mysterious happened. As soon as the plane flew into Vietnamese airspace, it disappeared from the radar. Its transponder, which is a device that sends out important flight information like the plane's number, altitude, speed, and direction, stopped working. This sudden malfunction made the plane invisible to radar, and the people on the ground had no idea where it was or what was happening to it. What made the situation even more strange and unsettling was that there were no distress signals or messages about bad weather or technical problems from the crew before the plane vanished. Around 1.30 a.m., the flight was detected again by both Malaysian military and civilian radars. But curiously, the plane was not following its planned route. It first turned back, then flew southwest across the Malay Peninsula. After that, it changed direction again and headed northwest across the Strait of Malacca. No one knows why the plane made these unusual moves. Was it because of a technical issue, a purposeful action, or something else entirely? During this confusing time, the pilot of another plane tried to get in touch with Flight 370. 
They use the international air distress frequency to pass on a message from the Vietnamese air traffic control, asking the Flight 370 crew to respond. The other pilot managed to make a connection, but the conversation was unclear. All they could hear were unclear sounds and static, making the whole situation even more puzzling and worrying. As the world slept, a shocking mystery unfolded in the skies. A plane vanished into thin air. Chapter 2 the vanishing. One early morning when everything was calm and quiet, something alarming happened at 2.22 a.m. The Malaysian military, which was always carefully watching the skies with its radar, suddenly lost sight of an airplane. This took place over the deep and dark waters of the Andaman Sea. The radar going quiet was a bad sign, suggesting that something was wrong. Not long after, at 2.40 a.m., things got even more worrisome. The people in charge of watching the skies, known as air traffic control, called Malaysia Airlines with some startling news. They said something that was hard to believe. Flight 370 had disappeared from their radar screens, and they couldn't see it anymore. This news was very troubling for Malaysia Airlines. They immediately started trying to find the plane. They called different places that helped control air traffic, and even spoke to other planes flying nearby to see if they knew anything. They were desperate to find out where Flight 370 had gone. As the sun started to rise at 5.30 a.m., the search got more intense. They were now, now full- Y'all know we watch, we watch a lot of weird, weird things on this channel, right? And for a lot of the things that we've seen take place in the sky, a lot of just unknowns happening, sightings, different things, do you think? Because nobody's ever mentioned a theory of something extraterrestrial, something, you know, not from this planet actually taking. Now think about that. All the sightings and different things that we've seen, could that be a possibility? Who knows? At this thing, at this point, you gotta throw something at the wall. Fully committed to finding the plane, focusing on two key areas, the South China Sea and the Gulf of Thailand. These were the last places the plane had been in touch with the people watching the skies. The need to find the plane was very strong and everyone was doing their best to locate it. After the plane went missing, lots of people were talking about it in the news. There were many different stories from people who thought they saw the plane. On March 19, 2014, different kinds of people, like fishermen, oil rig workers, and people living on the Kuda Huvadu Atoll in the Maldives, shared what they saw. They all said they saw a plane that looked like Flight 370. Some of these stories were really detailed. Near the coast of Kotobaru, a fisherman saw a plane flying very low, which was odd and worrying. Far away, 2999 kilometers southeast of Wang Tao, an oil rig worker saw something scary. He said he saw something burning in the sky that morning. The Vietnamese authorities thought this story was important, so they started a search and rescue mission because of it. Fishermen from Indonesia also had a scary story. They said they saw a plane crashing near the Malacca Straits, making the mystery even bigger. Three months later, a British woman sailing in the Indian Ocean had a similar story. She said she saw a plane on fire, which was both frightening and confusing. All these different stories made the disappearance of Flight 370 even more mysterious. Each story was different, but they all suggested something strange and tragic had happened. There were more questions than answers about what happened to the plane and the people on it. The search continued, driven by hope and the need to find out what happened in this sad and mysterious part of aviation history. Initially, the search for the missing plane focused on the South China Sea. This made sense because the plane was supposed to be flying there, but then everyone was surprised to learn something new. Flight 370 had left its planned route and was flying west. This changed everything. It meant the plane wasn't where they thought it was. So the search moved to a new area, the Strait of Malacca and the Andaman Sea. This was just the start of a mystery that got more confusing as time went on. Later, here's a question I never thought of as well. How hard is it, and if anybody's a pilot, y'all can answer this in the comment section, how hard is it to get disoriented in the skies like that to where you don't know where you are? I imagine like it could probably be pretty easy, right? That could be pretty easy for you to lose track of where you are. I'm guessing. Some important information came from signals the plane sent to a satellite. These signals were like secret messages, showing that the plane was still flying long after it vanished from radar. This was a big shock, 
The plane had been in the air for about six hours, and no one knew where it was. March 15th was a very important day in this strange story. It was a week after the plane had mysteriously disappeared. On this day, a company called Inmarsat shared some crucial information. It didn't say exactly where the plane was, but it gave some helpful hints. It suggested that the plane could be in one of two places. Maybe it went south, ending up somewhere in the Indian Ocean, southwest of Australia. Or it might have gone north, stretching from Vietnam to Turkmenistan. With the plane gone, the search takes a desperate turn, leading to more questions than answers. Chapter 3. Searching in Vain When it became clear that the airplane wasn't where they had been initially looking, the people in charge decided to significantly change their search strategy. They ceased their efforts in the South China Sea, Thailand's Gulf, and Malacca Strait. Shifting their focus, they started considering two new potential routes that the plane might have taken. However, there was a problem with these new routes. The northern route, which would have required the plane to fly over countries like Thailand and Kazakhstan, didn't seem very plausible. If the plane had taken this route, it would have had to fly through airspace that was constantly monitored by military radars. The countries in this region were quite sure that their radar systems would have detected an unfamiliar aircraft flying in their airspace. Because of this certainty, they quickly dismissed the northern route as a possibility. With the northern path now out of the question, the search area grew significantly larger. It was divided into two main regions. The first region was the Southern Arc, which extended into the deep and remote parts of the Indian Ocean, quite a bit southwest of Australia. The second region was even bigger, encompassing areas of Southeast Asia, parts of Western China, and the Indian subcontinent. The expansion of the search zone made the situation more complicated and uncertain than it already was. On a very sad day, March 24, 2014, the Prime Minister of Malaysia, Najib Razak, stepped forward to deliver a heart-wrenching message to the world. With great sadness, he announced that after detailed analysis of the last signals from the missing plane, a tragic conclusion had been drawn. This analysis was conducted with assistance from experts at Inmarsat and the UK Air Accidents Investigation Branch. They deduced that the plane's final position, before it disappeared, was somewhere over the southern Indian Ocean. This location led them to a grim realization. There were no safe landing spots in this vast open sea. The painful conclusion was that the airplane, along with everyone on it, must have plunged into the ocean. This incident marked a profoundly sorrowful chapter in the history of aviation, particularly for those connected to Flight 370. The flight carried 239 people, and it seemed highly unlikely that anyone could have survived such a disaster. At the time, this was the most devastating incident involving a Boeing 777. This sad record was held by Flight 370 for 131 days, until in another tragic turn of events, another Malaysia Airlines Boeing 777-200ER, Flight 17, was shot down on July 17, 2014. This second terrible incident took the lives of 298 people, surpassing the previous tragedy. The effort to find the missing Flight 370 turned out to be the most expensive in aviation history. It was an exceptionally challenging mission, primarily because the suspected crash site was in a very isolated part of the ocean. A glimmer of hope appeared on April 6, 2014, when an Australian ship in the middle of the ocean detected what seemed to be signals from the plane's black box. These signals were picked up approximately 2,000 kilometers northwest of Perth in Western Australia. Adding to this promising lead, Inmarsat data matched these signals' locations. However, there was a concern. If these signals were indeed from Flight 370, the black box's battery might be nearly out of power. They used a robotic submarine to search the area to investigate this lead. This was a formidable task. The signals had been detected over a broad area, and despite extensive efforts by the submarine, no parts of the plane were found. Later, it was suspected that these signals might have been false, possibly caused by a malfunction in the acoustic equipment used. The search continued with resolve until June 2015, but, regrettably, it didn't result in finding any wreckage or debris from Flight 370. It was not until July 29, 2015, that a small piece of hope was found. A part of the right wing, known as the Flapperon, was discovered on a beach on Reunion Island. This island is quite far away, about 3,700 kilometers west of the area where the Australian authorities had been searching in the Indian Ocean. 
Over the next year and a half, beaches in various countries such as Tanzania, Mozambique, South Africa, Madagascar, and Mauritius revealed 26 more pieces that were believed to be from the plane. Of these, three pieces were confirmed to be from Flight 370, and oh. 17 were highly likely to be from the aircraft. Two of these pieces came from the interior of the plane, indicating that the aircraft had broken apart. However, it was not clear whether this breakup occurred in the air or when the plane impacted the water. Further examination of the wing parts found, one on Reunion Island and another in Tanzania, led to a new understanding of the plane's final moments. It seemed that the plane did not make a controlled landing, meaning it wasn't being guided for a gentle landing on water. Some experts believe that Flight 370 might have crashed into the water in a steep dive. In January 2017, the governments of Malaysia, Australia, and China officially ended their search for Flight 370. However, an American company, Ocean Infinity, was allowed by the Malaysian government to continue the search. This extended search went on until May 2017, when the Malaysian Transport Ministry announced the conclusion of this additional search effort. In 2018, Malaysia's report hints that Flight 370 might have been taken over on purpose, not just broken. Chapter 4, A Kidnapped Flight? Back in the middle of 2018... Before they, they get into it, these are my reasonings, right? And this probably added on to something I might have said in another video, because each time I hear something, I think about something in a different way. I guess this is how detectives feel. But it was missing for six hours. That gives you time to figure out or to be hijacked, to communicate and, and with whoever you are on the ground with what you're trying to do and accomplish. And then the second thing, the second thing for me was the fact that they avoided the military, the, the radar in different airspaces that was being monitored. They avoided it. That seems planned to me. That seems calculated. How do you avoid airspace that's being monitored? You got to know the route to where if we get here, then we go this route, then we won't be monitored. We can go past this, that, and the third. You know what I mean? That That's what sticks out to me. Team, and to be more precise, in the month of July, the government authorities of Malaysia released what was considered their most detailed report about the baffling disappearance of Flight 370. This particular report was quite important because it almost completely ruled out the possibility that the airplane had failed due to some kind of mechanical malfunction. Rather, it strongly suggested that perhaps someone had intentionally altered the flight's path by taking manual control of the airplane. Even with these strong suggestions, the team of experts who were diligently working to solve this mysterious case found themselves at a loss to pinpoint the exact cause behind why Flight 370 vanished without leaving any clues behind. Following the disappearance of the plane, many people began to theorize about various scenarios, one of which was quite alarming, the possibility that the plane might have been hijacked. This wasn't just an unfounded suspicion, as there were some real reasons to consider it. For example, a very concerning discovery was made Two individuals had boarded Flight 370 using passports that were not their own. The passports had been stolen. This revelation raised immediate concerns. The passports in question, one from Austria and the other from Italy, had been reported as stolen in Thailand over the preceding two years. Interpol, which is a large international organization that assists police forces globally, confirmed that these passports were listed in their database that keeps track of lost and stolen travel documents. A major concern was that no one had checked these passports against the database when they were reported as stolen. The situation garnered even more scrutiny when Ahmad Zahid Hamidi, who was overseeing Malaysia's internal security, openly criticized his country's immigration officials. He expressed his frustration over their failure to prevent the two passengers who were using the stolen European passports from boarding the flight. These passengers had purchased one-way tickets through China Southern Airlines. Reports surfaced that a person from Iran, calling from Bangkok, had specifically requested the cheapest tickets available to Europe and had paid for them in cash. Subsequently, more information emerged. The two passengers were actually young Iranian men one aged 19 and the other 29. Yep. They had legally entered Malaysia on the last day of February, 
using their authentic Iranian passports. Speculations arose that these men might have been attempting to seek asylum. The head of Interpol even mentioned that they were leaning more towards the idea that this was not a case of terrorism. In the aftermath of the enigmatic disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370, teams from the United States and Malaysia began an exhaustive investigation into the backgrounds of everyone on the flight manifest. They painstakingly examined the life stories of each passenger. Concurrently, the Chinese government closely scrutinized the Chinese nationals on board. Their investigations made one thing clear. There was no indication that any of these people were connected to any kind of violent or terrorist activities. However, one individual momentarily attracted attention. This person was a flight engineer working for a Swiss jet charter company. His professional expertise in aviation made the authorities momentarily suspect him as a potential hijacker due to his specialized knowledge. Amidst all the circulating hypotheses and conjecture, one particularly sensational theory was proposed. Some theorized that Russian agents might have taken control of the plane. According to this theory, they deliberately crashed it in the remote deserts of central Kazakhstan. The proposed motive behind such an act was to divert attention from Russia's contentious actions in Crimea at that time. This theory conjured up images of international espionage and drama, although it lacked solid proof. As more information came to light in the perplexing case of Flight 370, one detail particularly captured the public's attention and sparked extensive discussions. Reports indicated that the cell phones of the passengers were still ringing long after the plane had vanished. In a desperate search for any trace of their loved ones, distressed family members repeatedly called the phones of those on board. To their surprise and bewilderment, they were greeted with the familiar sound of ringing. This led to rampant speculation on various social media platforms, with people wondering if the plane hadn't actually crashed, as most had assumed. There was a slight hope that perhaps it wasn't submerged at the bottom of the sea. However, this small beacon of hope was quickly addressed by telecommunications experts. They clarified that a cell phone ringing does not necessarily indicate that the call is being connected to the phone on the other end. When a call is made to a cell phone, the network first tries to locate the phone and establish a connection. If the network is unable to connect the call after several attempts or rings, it typically just ends the attempt. Therefore, the ringing heard by the families was likely just the network's attempts to connect the calls. While this explanation provided a technical reassurance, it did little to alleviate the deep sorrow and confusion surrounding the fate of the missing plane and its passengers. The mystery deepens with Flight 370's sudden turn and silence. Was it hijacked or something else? Chapter 5. Captain Zahari. The vanishing of Flight 370 is a real puzzle. This plane, with many people on board, just disappeared one night. People have come up with a lot of ideas about what might have happened. Like someone of taking course. a- it had to be an inside guy. You know what I mean? It, 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 they had to have some type of contact. Over the plane but not everyone believes this. Let me tell you why some people doubt this idea. The plane was flying at night over the Gulf of Thailand when it suddenly turned around. It then went over Malaysia, flying past big cities and small towns alike. After this big change in direction, nobody heard anything from the plane. In today's world, where we can talk and share things online all the time, this silence is strange. None of the people on the plane, whether they were traveling for fun or work, sent a message, made a call, posted a photo, or did anything online after the plane changed its path. This made the mystery even bigger and made people more worried. They, they might have didn't know. We think hijack, we think, okay, somebody pulled out some guns, somebody went up there, they turned around, looked at all the passengers, don't nobody move, nobody gets hurt. You know what I'm saying? It didn't necessarily have to be that. They could have thought they were on their regular path and they're back there sleeping. Why everything is taking place with the pilot and the co-pilot. That's what I'm saying. Like, th they, don't, they probably didn't know until it was maybe too late. Worried about what really happened during the flight. In our time, when everyone is always connected, it's really weird that nobody from Flight 370 said anything. This has made many experts argue, and guess what happened? Most of the people on the plane were from Malaysia and China, where pretty much everyone has a phone especially those who go to other countries. So why was there no word from them? Did they not want to talk? Could they not? Or were they not allowed to? 
Maybe the plane was so high up that their phones didn't work. Or perhaps they tried to reach out, but couldn't. Each of these ideas adds to the mystery. As more people look into these ideas, the story of Flight 370 becomes more complicated and interesting, and everyone is waiting for some hint to solve this big puzzle. The military radar saw something strange about Flight 370. After it turned, it flew really high, way higher than it should have. It went up to 45,000 feet, when it was only supposed to go up to 43,100 feet. Then, as it went over Malaysia, it came down to about 23,000 feet, before going back up to 29,500 feet. It stayed at this height for a while. This moving up and down is probably why people's phones didn't work. Whether they turned their phones on during the flight or they were already on, they couldn't connect to the towers on the ground because the plane was too high. When trying to figure out why Flight 370 didn't go where it was supposed to, people in the US thought that maybe someone in the cockpit changed the plane's settings. They thought it might have been flown on purpose over the Indian Ocean. The Malaysian government wanted to know more, so they checked out the pilots' homes and looked at the bank and credit card records of all 12 crew members. They also checked other things, like where they lived. About a month after the plane disappeared, the head of police in Malaysia said they had talked to over 170 people, including the families of the pilots and crew. The main suspect was the captain, Zahari Ahmad Shah, especially if it turned out that a person was behind the plane's disappearance. There was a scary idea about Captain Zahari. Some people thought he might have planned to crash the plane on purpose, taking everyone with him. They thought he might have locked the other pilot out of the cockpit, cut off all contact with the outside, made the air in the plane bad, and then let the plane fly by itself until it ran out of fuel. Whoa, 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 whoa. You could make the air in the plane bad? Y'all knew this? Frequent flyers? Did y'all know that? I didn't know that. When they looked into Zahari's life, they found out he was married with three adult kids and lived in a safe place with two homes. In his main home, he had a flight simulator game that he used a lot. When they searched his house, they found the simulator and something odd about it. The simulator had a flight path like Flight 370s, going deep into the Southern Ocean and then pretending to land on a small island. Even though these records were deleted, experts got them back. They saw that the path on Zahari's simulator was almost the same as the actual path Flight 370 took. This made people think Zahari might have had a plan to crash the plane, maybe because of personal problems. Zahari, the pilot of Flight 370, was having a hard time in his life. He was dealing with separating from his wife, which is tough for anyone. He was also upset about a family member, Anwar Ibrahim, who got a five-year prison sentence right before Zahari's flight. This could have made him more upset. But Zahari's wife said he wasn't having these problems. His family and friends agreed, saying he loved his family and job too much to do something bad. As the investigation went on, the police in Kuala Lumpur worked with experts from the FBI to look at Zahari's flight simulator. They checked it really well and found nothing to show Zahari planned to take over Flight 370. This led the investigation in a new direction. Then they started to look at Farik Abdul Hamid, the co-pilot. They found out something shocking. While the plane was flying low along Malaysia's coast, Farik tried to make a phone call from his own phone. The call got cut off quickly. Later, they confirmed that the call did connect for a short time with a tower in Penang State. They think the call ended because the plane was moving fast and left the tower's area before it could connect to another one. New clues emerge. The co-pilot tried to call someone mid-flight. What secret was he hiding? Chapter 6. Farik's Secret Hint The enigma surrounding the situation grew as the specifics of this particular phone call stayed hidden. Everyone was wondering, who was Farik trying to contact at such a pivotal moment? The of officials course. and people involved in the investigation were not saying anything. They kept the details and the intended person for the call a secret. With all this secrecy, rumors began to spread fast. People were quietly suggesting different ideas without any real proof. Some thought that Farik, perhaps dealing with personal problems, might have made a sudden, extreme decision. It was rumored that he could have taken over the airplane, deliberately turned off its systems, and locked himself in the cockpit. If this was true, it would have been a terrible situation. The people working on the plane and the passengers would have been stuck, unable to get into the cockpit during an emergency. These kinds of thoughts made the already puzzling and sad story of Flight 370 
even more grim and tragic. There were guesses that Farik might have been facing hard times in his private life, maybe with his love life. People wondered if these issues had gotten so bad that he saw this shocking and sad event with the flight as a way to escape his own pain. Although this is a dramatic idea, it shows a picture of a man pushed to his limits, feeling like there was no other choice. However, it's important to look at the other parts of his life that seem to disagree with this idea. Farik wasn't just any pilot. He was deeply in love and about to start a whole new part of his life. He was going to marry another pilot, 26-year-old Captain Nadira Ramley, who worked for another airline. Everyone said their relationship made him happy. This upcoming wedding shows us a man excited about his future, not someone wanting to end it. On top of that, his career was also something he was very proud of and passionate about. Being a pilot wasn't just a job for him, he loved it. It was a career he was fully committed to, and it brought him a lot of joy. His dedication to his work was clear, and those who knew him could see how important being a pilot was to him. When you think about these parts of his life, it's difficult to understand why he would choose such a tragic and irreversible path. His plans to get married and his love for his work suggest he had many reasons to keep living. This makes us question whether the idea that personal problems drove him to take over the flight with a tragic goal is likely or not. The contrast between the idea that he was in despair and the reality of a man excited about getting married and passionate about his job makes the mystery even more complex. It pushes us to not settle for simple answers and to think about all aspects of his life. This way of investigating is more thorough and shows respect for the complexity and depth of human feelings and actions. In situations like this, the truth is often not just clear-cut, but found in our lives in subtle and varied aspects.